Hello and welcome to this episode of the University of Southampton's English A-Level podcast, where lecturers and students at the Department of English in Southampton discuss key texts and techniques that will help you achieve the best English A-Level you, you can. So today I'm here to discuss The Handmaid's Tale and I'm with two second year students in English in Southampton. Hi, my name is Jeanette Quell and I went to Townley Grammar School in Bexley Heath and I study The Handmaid's Tale along with Brave New World. And my name is Luke, I went to Salesian Sixth Form in Chertsey, which is in Surrey. I study The Handmaid's Tale alongside George Orwell's 1984. Okay. So here we're, uh, today we're here to talk about The Handmaid's Tale, which is um, a, a novel that many of our students who apply to Southampton write on. So it's a very popular novel, and I just thought um, I'd start by giving a brief synopsis of what this novel is about. So The Handmaid's Tale is a novel by the Canadian author Margaret Atwood, which was first published in 1985. that tells the story of Offred, who is a handmaiden in the Republic of Gilead. Now, Gilead is a future society in which fertility has drastically declined, and any women who are still able to have children are enslaved as handmaids, who are appointed to commanders and their wives. Now, the novel takes the form of a confession by someone called Offred, whose name comes her from her commander, Offred, we never know her real name, um, which is forbidden, because in the world of Gilead, women are forbidden to read and write. The confessions are broken up into different sections and they alternate between recounting how Gilead came into being, evolving out of the United States in the 1980s, how Offred was captured, and ultimately, in the conclusion, how she is bundled into a van by the secret police and we don't know what happens to her and that's where the story ends. Except, there's a twist, which is that there's an appendix put on the novel called Historical Notes, which are set in 2195, and that reveals that what we have read is a transcription of a tape recording which is now being studied by future historians. So that's roughly what The Handmaid's Tale is about. And uh, I'd be interested to know, Shanette and Luke, what did you write about in your uh, essays on The Handmaid's Tale? What were you trying to say about this novel? So in... <clears throat> sorry. So with our assignment, we had to pick out what we wanted to talk, discuss in our essay in comparison with another novel. So I particularly looked at how um, these governments would control the people and how that came to be without people really knowing mm -hmm. until it was too late. So that was my comparison with and, The Handmaid's Tale. And you compared it with? Brave New World Brave by New Huxley. World. Yes, good, good. And Luke, what did you, what did you write um, about The Handmaid's Tale and, and what section of your paper did you write about on? So, when I studied The Handmaid's Tale, we were comparing it with 1984, drawing similarities between the two dystopian worlds, how both governments exert control over the population in vastly different and similar ways, and how they exert control through language and lots of different ways of manipulation of power. Mm -hmm. And through this, I found both similarities and differences between the texts. Good, good. So... The, one of the reasons The Handmaid's Tale is such a popular novel, I guess, at A-level and, and indeed in university, is that it enables a lot of comparisons. Classic novels like Brave New World, but also 1984. And we're going to go on to talk about um, some of those novels a little bit later on, and also about the idea of dystopian literature. Um, good. So one thing that's always very important to know about any novel is its historical context. And even though The Handmaid's Tale can feel very uh, contemporary today, um, perhaps maybe too contemporary, if you see a lot of the protesters um, in the United States um, on the Women's March, they dressed as handmaids. Um, it is important to remember that the novel was set in the 1980s. And I just thought I'd talk through some aspects of the historical context that might be useful to know for a student studying this. So... What The first thing, I guess, to know most broadly about the historical context is that it was written in the 1980s, and indeed Atwood wrote it while living in East Berlin, which um, in West Berlin, and visiting East Berlin, 
at a time when Germany was split into a, a democratic and a communist controlled country. So Atwood was very interested in Cold War totalitarianism and the way in which the Soviet Union was a totalitarian state that prevented uh, the people's freedom. And so if you were kind of interested in exploring the historical context of the novel, you definitely might want to look into thinking about it as a response to uh, Cold War totalitarian politics, which is similar for 1984, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another important aspect of the historical context of the novel is uh, 1980s feminism. So there's always very, you know, feminism has been going on for centuries, but in the 1980s it was taking a very particular turn. Um, and one thing that is referenced is the rise of the anti-pornography movement. So there's a little episode where um, Alfred remembers her and her mother burning pornographic magazines. And uh, a, major, a major theme in, in, in the 80s in feminism was, was the anti-pornography campaign. And if you're interested in exploring that... There is a uh, feminist philosopher called Andrea Dworkin, who wrote a lot about the problems of pornography. Um, another important part of that context was that the 1980s in the United States was the era of the rise of what is called the New Right. So you had President Ronald Reagan, who was trying to shift America in a more conservative direction. And you also had the beginnings of a very strong Christian evangelical movement, which is still very present today. Finally, one, one other aspect of the 1980s as a historical period that feeds into this novel is the rise of the green movement and the consciousness of um, environmental pollution. So while we today are obviously very aware of things like climate change, um, the 1980s was, was when sort of the first, I guess, political movements about ecology were beginning to develop and this novel is very much concerned with climate change um, and, and in ecological pollution. So there's probably quite a lot there of historical <laughs> context. And I was wondering, the Chenette, uh, in what ways, either in thinking about this novel in A levels or perhaps thinking about it now, does the historical context shape how you interpret it? Well, the historical context especially in The Handmaid's Tale, was definitely important to what I wrote about mm -hmm. because I was exploring how totalitarian governments can build the foundations in order to establish themselves without the people really knowing. Mm -hmm. So um, mm. with the rise of the second wave of feminism, it would make sense to compare it to The Handmaid's Tale because the timelines almost match almost yes. identically. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that you have the rise of the new right, which is still kind of very <laughs> so it's the fact that they usually would place blame onto one so like mm -hmm. you need a scapegoat scapegoat yeah so with in the handmaid's tale the scapegoat was there's a declining fertility in this particular population mm -hmm. we need to find some a solution and gilead came in as a way to fix that problem, therefore making the whole society utopian, yes. quote unquote. Yeah, yeah. But it wasn't because it meant that systematic dehumanization of women. Yeah. When reversed the lives. So it, even in the text, women ended up fighting for their own oppression. Yes. Which you find with the commander's wife. Yeah, Serena, yeah. Yeah. So you find her on the TV, like watching herself. Yes like campaign for all of these things that have entrapped her, which is yeah. quite interesting to see. So the historical context is really important, especially in this novel. Yeah, yeah. And of course, Chanette was referring to the very well-known TV adaptation, um, which is available on Hulu and Amazon Prime. Not that we're promoting any companies, but <laughs> it's good to watch. Uh, Luke, um, did, I, did you bring any of the historical context into your essays? Yeah, a slightly different context I looked at at the time was... Obviously, the novel was written in 1985, and at that time, mm -hmm. it was Ronald Reagan who yeah. wanted to promote family values and traditional values, and I think that's very much subverted in the novel, and Atwood builds on that, and she also is, I believe she's an agnostic, she doesn't yes. actually believe in a religion, and that's obviously very much reflected in the novel, so I think these historical contexts definitely help shape your understanding of the novel and give you insight into what was happening at the time. Definitely. Thank you very much. 
Um, so, uh, a second thing that is very striking about this novel is its form. And so the way it's put together as what initially seems like a confession from Alfred, but then you sort of realize that it's obviously um, a series of different recordings she's made over time. And then at the end, it's revealed that what we read in the book is a transcription from an audio recording. So there's lots of ways in which the, the form of this novel gives meaning, but one that I wanted to kind of focus on is this idea of it having an unreliable narrator. So obviously our empathies and sympathies are with Alfred, but there's a great passage that's worth paying attention to at the beginning of chapter 23, which people probably have different page editions, but it's really just the beginning of chapter 3, where all of a sudden Alfred reveals... And I'll read this out. This is a reconstruction. All of it is a reconstruction. It's a reconstruction now in my head as I lie flat on my single bed rehearsing what I should or shouldn't have said, what I should or shouldn't have done, how I should have played it. And then she says, When I get out of here, if I'm ever able to set this down in any form, even in the form of one voice to another, it will be a reconstruction too at yet another remove. So for me, this is always a very disorienting moment because it certainly is revealed that these things that seem so raw and visceral um, are perhaps a reconstruction and perhaps made up. So any discussion of this novel, I think, would have to engage with the idea of Alfred as an unreliable narrator and the fact that what we're reading as a retrospective construction. Um, Another key genre uh, or key critical concept you might want to think about the form of this novel is the idea of dystopian literature. I think, Luke, you spoke mm -hmm. about treating this novel as a dystopia. What, what, is it, what made it a dystopia for you? Uh, so it's creating like a sort of society where it strives to be like a utopian society. Mm -hmm. uh, 1984 was like a totalitarian uh, society which has the government that upholds ultimate power. So it's sort of creating this society where the ultimate power lies with the government mm -hmm. and they have total control over like the masses and do this via technology, language, etc. Yes, good. And uh, you both mentioned this point that dystopias are often related to utopias. Shanad, you said something about that. Why, why are those two things connected for you? I think, <clears throat> I think those things are connected because... The, what the aims of the societies in the novels would always try to strive for a perfect society, but they realise a perfect society can't exist because people are allowed to have their own free will and autonomy, mm -hmm. and that usually means that good and bad will be present in that society, and conforming to one way or another will always end up forming into a dystopia. So, for example, in The Handmaid's Tale, the idea of getting these women to produce babies so that the population can grow mm -hmm. is a kind of utopian kind of thinking, but it doesn't work out because it removes the autonomy from women. And in Brave New World, um, where all the people are not born naturally, mm, yes, um, everyone, uh, the, the structure of the family is completely dissolved, there is no familial ties, there's always a set, um, like, st a set, Cast yes, yes, yeah. that you're into, what depending on how good you are or how good your birth is. Yeah, um, it's all to think like because they see families as a problem. Mm -hmm. So, it, yes. yeah, it would really. <laughs> yeah, there. So there's always something about uh, as as a literary genre, the the dystopian novel is actually always connected to the utopian novel, um, and famously the first utopia was by uh, someone called Thomas More in the 16th century. I don't know the date, but um, there's a longer literary tradition of sort of imagined utopias as perfect societies, but then you get um, dystopias. But there's, a, there's a, always a connection between a utopia and a dystopia that's important to know, I think. Um, and finally, one of the things that is very important, I think, about this novel is its ending. Okay, and the, uh, I guess, framing as everything that we've read as a historical source, okay? So, 
one of the things it makes us realize is that even though it gives us the illusion of being narrated in real time, of course that can't be the case, right? She can't be narrating every, every day because how is she recording it or transcribing it? It also raises the question of when we have this kind of funny conference of a group of academics treating it as a historical document, um, it makes us question, well, how do we interpret it as a fictional one? And there is a sort of key and a very, I guess, um, tricksy phrase that, that um, the, the lecturer says, um, and you'll find it in, in, in any edition in the historical notes. He says that, um, in my opinion, we must be cautious about passing moral judgments upon the Gileadians. Surely we have learned by now that such judgments are of necessity culture specific. So I think most of us, uh, at least in this room, would disagree with um, the world of Gilead. Yet there's a funny idea, perhaps when you study something historically, you tend to excuse differences. So one thing the ending does is that it asks us to think about the difference between interpreting something historically and as a novel. So um, I'd like to talk a bit more maybe about how this, how the form of the novel shapes how you interpret it. Uh, and I was wondering maybe, Luke and Jeanette, how did you deal with um, interpreting the form of this novel? Either the way it's kind of a found journal, or how did you process the ending? So I think in light of the ending and the whole novel it sort of raised that question as to whether the novel is like a historical document or like lit, like literary uh, one. Mm. Uh, the ending is definitely very ambiguous as to what what happens from that and obviously the bit at the end tries to clarify that but I think it sort of suggests that that she was never going to survive in such a society mm -hmm. um, and was therefore obviously captured and taken away um, and but whether the whole thing is is from like an unreliable perspective like can we trust her perspective and yeah and I think that maybe we'll see a lot of comparisons to 1984 as well where obviously there's no place for for everyone like to survive and flourish in a totalitarian world and that's an overarching theme generally in dystopian mm. novels but yeah I think definitely raises a question as to whether it's a literary document or like a historical one. Mm. Shanet, how did you deal with the, the, the form of the novel? Well, when reading it for the first time, I was really confused as to why I was presented with something that was in real time and now finding out it was historical. Yes. So I spent a lot of time trying to figure out the timeline, meaning that this novel would have been 2195, looking back at around now, 2000 yeah. to about now. So... And then I read the novel again, but this time without historical notes, to see how my reading would have changed if I had never gotten historical notes mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. an appendix. And what I found from that is that I trusted Offred more when I didn't have historical notes, because historical, hist mm -hmm. the ending appendix kind of made everything almost seem as if it was a dream, or yes. if it was... It's just a historical, just histo just a story. Yeah. And that point when you said that everything we can't judge it on culture specific though, I think that's quite true because I am me personally, I like looking at historical things and yeah. looking way into the future. It gives me like a lot of time to analyse what they did here, um, what how did their culture operate. Yeah. And I find it very disconcerting to study things that are present yes. right now. Yeah. So that's what the novel did to me for the first time. And like comparing that to Brave New World and the ending of Brave New World, it fills me with an, like sort of dread knowing that the society will never, ever, ever get back to what I think would be normal. Yes. And the finding that there's no escape for either of the both, either character of both novels is probably like the most important part of a totalitarian um, text. Yes, so the idea that even literature offers no escape is, is pretty bleakly totalitarian. Well, um, one thing that's often very useful in, in approaching a complex novel like this is to engage with some other critics and critical essays that might help you shape your own voice. 
Um, and it also enables you to use someone else's interpretation, not to simply just copy it, but as a platform for sort of developing your own ideas. So I just thought I would suggest um, two um, pieces of criticism that someone studying this text might read. And there's no need to take it down in too much detail because there'll be po uh, the list of all the things we discuss are posted alongside this podcast on the website. But um, the first uh, book I'd recommend is a kind of very recent book. It's called Dystopia and Natural History by Gregory Clays. And that's published by Oxford University Press in 2017. And I would just recommend anyone sitting The Handmaid's Tale to read the introduction. Because often if you want to bring in the idea of the dystopia, it's important, as, as you, Jeanette and Luke, know from university, that you have to define your concept, right? And this gives a very good definition of dystopia in literary history. And in a way, it kind of goes through a lot of, of what uh, our very smart students have already said, that dystopia is always bound up with an image of utopia. Um, and it does other useful things, like it gives a sort of quick literary history of previous ones, again, mentoring 1984 and Brave New World. And it, it interestingly says that all dystopias are about a relationship between a political dystopia, an economic dystopia, and an ecological dystopia. So that's interesting that it's always somehow to do with ecology. The second piece of criticism I, I would recommend is a, a classic study on unreliable narrators. So the book is called The Rhetoric of Fiction by Wayne Booth. Uh, first published in 1961, but we'll list a more modern edition. And that has a chapter which introduced, for the first time in criticism, the idea of the unreliable narrator. So again, it gives a good definition of what that is. You should always define your terms when you bring it in. And it gives you a nice literary history of unreliable narrators, starting with people like Henry James and Joseph Conrad. And even reading that might set up ideas for comparisons. But, you know, one of the things you do a lot more, I think, in university English is engage with other critics. And I was wondering, maybe, Shanette and Luke, what have you learned about engaging with critics at university that you would like to recommend to people studying A-level, just simply how do you structure the paragraph and so on? Well, in year 13, I would always look at critics as like the ultimate um, opinion mm. because I would think that, well, this is published and this is peer-reviewed, so they definitely have to be right. So I wouldn't like argue with them as much as I would now. Well, I think the most important thing is to engage with, to engage with the critics is re definitely read it and read it over again mm -hmm. and then find your own opinion on what they have said and don't, don't take, like, r absorb their opinion into your own. Um, you should engage critically by um, asking questions or how they came to that conclusion or how you've come to your own conclusion using their analysis and how your reading informs um, your viewing of the critic. Yes. So one of the things we, we, we teach a lot at university is you bring in another critic, A, as Shana said, make sure you understand it, and B, use it um, as a platform for developing your own ideas. So say, critic X argues this, that's true to a certain extent, but I want to add something new. Uh, Luke, what, what, what advice would you give for engaging with, with critics, either in The Handmaid's Tale or just in general? I think building on what Jeanette said, um, obviously challenging what critics say and not taking it as the ultimate opinion, but also uh, take looking at different critics throughout time and perhaps how it's changed. Oh, yeah. Looking at critics maybe from 1985, the contemporary ones, when it was written and now what critics have to say about it now. And I think also another thing that perhaps I should have done more of when I was studying the novel is placing it um, alongside other dystopian novels as well as 1984 because obviously I was primarily was comparing 1984 with The Handmaid's Tale but maybe I should have looked at other dystopian novels such as Brave New World, Drowned World and all, all various other one. novels. Fahrenheit 451. Yeah. Four, other five novels one. such yeah. as them and there's a broad range of them to, to compare with The Handmaid's Tale. Yeah. So, that, so that's a very good point that, you, you know, a lot of your A-level 
work will be structured around comparing two novels quite closely. But having other novels as a sort of frame of reference to kind of refer to, um, just maybe in introductions or conclusions, makes your essay seem really strong because it shows what a, what a wide reader that you are. Um, and that, I guess, kind of leads into something that I, that I would like to suggest is that um, what are kind of comparative texts that might work very well with The Handmaid's Tale? So obviously you had uh, 1984 by George Orwell and Brave New World is Aldous Huxley. And while they're often kind of classically compared, one thing you might always be conscious of in your discussion of The Handmaid's Tale is how it foregrounds the question of gender and women's reproduction as as both of you have mentioned, which is perhaps slightly different in the other novels. And you also would want to pay a lot of attention to how the form of this is very different, the playing with the found journal and the historical notes. But other texts uh, you might want to think about comparing it to, or even just reading, uh, one is a very good 1970s novel called Woman on the Edge of Time by Marge Piercy where a woman called Connie receives, uh, she's put in, in a mental home and receives telepath telepathetic uh, communications from a woman called Lucy, who lives in the future. But in contrast to The Handmaid's Tale, the future there is a, is a feminist utopia. Uh, it's called Matapoiset. Uh, another great novel to read, um, to compare, is called The Golden Notebook by Doris Lessing from 1961. And that is a comparison more in the terms of how uh, a novel uses um, the found journal. So the Golden Notebook is structured around four different journals that are found belonging to a woman writer called Anna Wolf. And a similar question about the, the reliability of that. Uh, and finally, one I just thought about on the way in here was um, The Road by Cormac McCarthy. Have you read that? Yes, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I thought that might be a good comparison because of the more kind of ecological theme. Mm. Yeah. So they're just some, some ideas of, of comparison. So, but you guys compared it both to uh, Brave, New World. Brave New World and 1984. <coughs> and could you maybe just kind of talk us through one key comparative theme that, that you focused on? Because that's key to a good comparison. What was... So a key comparison for you, Shannon. Uh, my key comparison, I would definitely say, is how social order was formed. Mm -hmm. Because in Brave New World, they are identified by the colours that they wear. Yeah. And certain colours would mean certain things. And and that is replicated in The Handmaid's Tale, yes. which certain colours represent what they are, what yes. forms their identity. Yeah. So, for example, I think, if I'm remembering this kit, Right, um, off red's red, yes, would symbolize that she was a handmaid, yes, and that um, the commander's wife would wear blue, yeah, I think to symbolize the mother Mary, maybe green, blue, blue, green. No, I think green was, was the green's a TV and blue's a book, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, good. And, and Luke, what's one key comparative theme for you? Uh, I'd say, yeah, the way they exert power through like, clothing, maybe an example, like the blue overalls in 1984 um, and obviously the handmaids you can even see in the recent production uh, they wear red so that mm. exerts their control and also religion obviously is play in a totalitarian society plays a big part to exert control um, obviously in 1984 they all um, look up to the big brother yeah. and its omniscient presence uh, and, and I think that is also important the use of religion to exert control, but yeah, there are many different comparisons um, which you can obviously look at further into. Good. And so, to conclude, I was kind of wondering um, if you both could offer one piece of advice to your 17 or 18 year old self, nervously <laughs> doing A-levels, uh, what would it be? Well, for my advice to my younger self, I would definitely plan along the way instead of leaving it as a set time, mm -hmm. because now that I'm doing bigger essays, well, which require a lot more research, I would have to organise my time a little bit better. So there wouldn't be time to just leave it to, oh, the week before it's due. Um, I would have to do all of my notes at the same, like, 
the lecture that I would have. So I would organise, okay, what could I possibly say if a question were to come up yeah. on themes or form or about structure? And yeah, I think that, yeah, I think planning is really important. Luke, what would you tell a young Luke? Uh, I think, looking back in hindsight, I'd tell a younger Luke to maybe, as I'm reading the novel um, of The Handmaid's Tale, to constantly be thinking of themes that interlink with 1984 and also, as I said, other dystopian novels. And I think just read as much as you can, to be honest with you, because obviously the more you read, the more comparisons you have in your answers and the yeah, the more strength your answers will be. Read as much as you can. I can't imagine a better <laughs> piece of advice for any part of your life. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Luke. Thank you, Shanette. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for listening.